So welcome everybody, happy to see you. Uh, we're very happy, privileged to uh, welcome Jan Eckhardt. Thank you for coming over, Jan. Um, we have a good, um, we are in the habit of not making long introductions. So I could do a very long introduction, all the places you've been. Uh, it suffice to say that Jan is, of course, one of the more uh, influential Flemish speaking economists in the world these days. His book, The Profit uh, Paradox, and all the work that, that preceded it uh, made uh, uh, immense waves, uh, it has had uh, a lot of impact. Uh, his uh, book, The Profit Paradox, is coming out in Dutch this week, and that's the reason why you are again back in the low countries because he's, uh, he's passing through Belgium and, and through the Netherlands. Um, so Jan, uh, without further ado, I'm going to give you the floor and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Eva. Thank you very much, Lucas, for uh, organizing it. Um, thank you for all for, for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm, I should say I'm particularly excited and looking forward to the type of views that uh, you have. As you know, I'm an economist, and I, I know that many of you are working more in policy. Some of you are doing a, a, a work more in a historic context. So I, I, I would love to hear your views on this because this is clearly an, an economist's uh, viewpoint and, and 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 it's one viewpoint so um i should also say this is uh based on a lot of joint work uh, some of it and and i think the, the most kind of key work is, is together with jan de looker at, at uh, leuven um and and it's a, a a lot of data work what the the book is doing is putting it all together using the data without going into the details of the analysis, uh, which we tend to do as kind of academics, uh, sometimes probably too often, and then, you know, try and, and put a lot of the different pieces together in, in, in one uh, coherent uh, uh, narrative, if you want. So let me start by introducing the paradox, but maybe, you know, being in an educational institution with an uh, uh, kind of a, a parallel story from from education which is the following that if you think about one kid bullying another kid then one child suffers if a teacher doesn't care in the classroom then 20 children suffer but when an education system is uh, not working then basically millions suffer and so i'm going to talk about a system that's not working a system that's broken i think it's an economic system but it's very much also a social system that has far-reaching implications and, and to give you an idea of what that system really implies um let me tell you the story of of two people this is a, a personal experience um one is is basically the 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 story of, of my friend alex and i met him before the pandemics about two and a half years ago and we meet up in a bar and i ask him how are things going he was in california at the time i say how's how are things in Silicon Valley? And he says, you know, after greeting me effusively because we hadn't seen each other, he says, no good because I'm moving out and I'm giving up. And in fact, now he lives in Portugal, he moved out. And I asked him what has happened. He says, I, was, I stopped, you know, my attempt to running a startup. He had had a different incarnation of the same idea as a startup and it hadn't worked. And as he was explaining to me what exactly had happened, we were, seeing on the screens of the tv this was by the way in the united states so you have all these screens everywhere and there was in it was in the afternoon so there was news going on and the news was at that time the dow jones had reached twenty five thousand. and then everyone you know typically says this is great news for the economy the dow jones is reaching a new high and the news anchor was talking about the fact that this was so good for the economy that this is a sign of a you know, thriving, booming economy, that there's a healthy economy. And as we hear that story, Alex tells me, um, and he says, you know, this booming economy, I don't see it. And it's not just me, I see it around me because I've lived in this environment of uh, startups. Um, you know, it's not really going that well there in startup world, even in, in, in Silicon Valley. <clears throat> and as we're talking, the other person who joins us is actually the, the, the bartender. And the bartender says, well, you know, they talk about how thriving the economy is. He says, um, 
I've been doing this job for since 2004, so this was you know 15 years by that time, and you know I pay I get paid exactly the same as I was paid back then. And so, if you want to kind of focus in on these two examples, okay, they're going to be very central to what I'm going to try and explain with the profit paradox. And what is the the, the profit paradox? Is the profit paradox is really saying how can it be that on the one hand, you know, the economy seems to be booming at least from the point of view of the stock market, which really is profits. And at the same time, entrepreneurs, the one who runs a startup or tries to run a startup or the person doing you know, a normal job like a bartender, they don't see any of that. And I'm gonna argue that the reason why this is, and this is the evidence that we've collected in, in, in the research, that you know, the system that's broken, that I'm gonna argue is really a system in which there is probably contradictorily not enough competition, that is really not enough competition between firms. And you say, well, competition, I mean, that's kind of strange, right? I mean, it's a competitive firm makes profit. So, so what's, what's the issue? And so <clears throat> let me first start by showing the facts. And <clears throat> the other thing I want to say is that all these facts are about really long term uh, or, or long horizon issues. I'm going to look at, well, long horizon economics, at least for, for decades. Uh, it's not, you know, historical in that sense, but what I'm trying to say is that a lot of people focus on cyclical uh, outcomes, especially when it comes to profitability, stock market uh, uh, wages. I really want to focus on, on, on longer horizons. And what we see is that there's really a breaking point in 1980 where things start to change. And, and I'm going to argue that there's, you know, something that's changing. So before I do that, let me show you what the, the, uh, the facts are. I think I have to do So let me start with the profits. And you say, well, I'm going to show you the Dow Jones. Is this profits? Well, really, yes, because what is the stock market value? It's basically all the future profits that investors expect to get out of it, which is dividends. And so the stock market valuation is an indicator of profitability in the future of, of firms. And if you look at the Dow Jones starting after the Second World War, what you see is that actually until 1980, the Dow Jones didn't move much. This is in real terms adjusted for inflation. And then in 1980, it started to kind of increase. There's the 2000 kind of bust and there's cyclicality. But even in the last bit, there's been enormous uh, an enormous increase in the Dow Jones. And this is the story that we heard. By the way, we were talking about 25,000. Now it's 34, 35, 36,000. So you're, even in two or three years, uh, it's, it's gone up an enormous amount. And in fact, the pandemic, and we can talk about the pandemic in, in, in a little bit, has made things even more intense in that sense. But this is, I think, a striking fact that until 1980, in fact, in 1981, the lowest point kind of in the middle there, the Dow Jones has a level that's exactly the same as in 1948. So if you put in $1 in 1948 in 1981, you still have $1, okay? If you put in $1 in 1981 and you go to 2020, I haven't done the back of the envelope calculation, but you want to have something like uh, uh, probably two or $300, okay? So there's, there's a huge difference and that's a reflection of what has happened to, to profits, okay? Now, what has gone on, what goes on at a firm level? Why do these, or what happens when these, these profits change? Well, if you look at what happens at a firm and then you can kind of extrapolate it to what happens at an economy-wide level, some of what's being paid goes to workers. Some of it is going to machines. I say machines, but it can be intangibles, right? It can be software, so it's investments. And then whatever's left over is profits. And in 1981, the division was two thirds, one third and 2% roughly. Okay, what has happened since then? What has happened since then is that these profits have been increasing a lot, okay? At the cost of both workers and machines. And by 2019, they were 14%. Now you ask, you know, what is this really telling us? It's basically saying that there's some form of kind of redistribution in the division of the pie, literally the division of the pie. But there's one very important thing to be said here is that this is the average profit rate. This is like, I look at the entire economy, but it turns out that this 14% goes to just a small number of firms. 
And in fact, to come back to the Dow Jones, the Dow Jones is an index of 30 firms. In the world, that's an estimate, there's over 100 million firms. In the United States alone, there's 6 million firms. So we're talking here about a few hundred firms, even beyond the Dow Jones. If you take the S&P 500, you know, there's only 500 firms in there. Now, of course, they're very important because they're very big and they have a big share of GDP. The reason why they're in there is because they're big firms. And so when you see this 14%, really what you also should see at the same time is that within profits, these large firms have much higher profit rates. Okay, That's why, again, this Dow Jones has increased so much. So there's a lot of distribution issues within the pool of firms. And this brings me back to the story of startups, Alex's story. What was Alex's story? Really, he had developed some peer-to-peer communication between mobile devices. One of the big mobile producers was interested in it. They were in negotiations to actually take over the firm. But eventually, their own engineers had figured out what you know his plan was. And basically, he, he as he always says, I, I made him see the light, and they did it themselves. And this is not just an isolated case. This happens a lot. What other many of these big tech firms do often is what they we call they have killer acquisitions. They basically take over, they pay for a firm, and then they kill it because that's a competitor less. And so this is something that's not just the story of my friend Alex. In fact, if you look at the startups as a share of all the firms, it was just under 14% in the late 70s. What happened is that it dropped to around 7 8%. Okay. Now you say, this can't be true because startups, you know, this is the period 80s and onwards when the digital revolution started. This is when all the startups were there. I mean, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, they were all startups at some point. And they're the successful ones. But one of the things with startups is that you have a lot of failing startups. But if they're not even starting, right, you see that this has a, a huge implication. Now, if you think about what do startups do to the economy, they're really typically small firms with very fast growing firms. Okay, and so they hire disproportionately. So you see this very clearly in the data. Startup firms, the ones that are basically young, that's what the definition of a startup firm is. These are firms that grow much faster than all other firms and they innovate a lot more. And also they hire many more young workers. Okay, now in a way they're the building blocks of the economy. Okay, because that's really what the economy is thriving on. And we've seen a decline in innovation, by the way, in the last 10 years despite this idea that we're living in this digital age where everything is transforming everything and it does but we see a decline in innovation and this is one of the biggest signs of it we see very few uh, startups so this story of one individual having to give up uh, uh, the startup is not just an isolated story it's really very much in the statistic and by the way we see this also around the world this is not just in the us we see this uh, everywhere the second I think striking fact is the fact that's related to our bartender. And I'm gonna show you now again, after the uh, Second World War, the evolution of productivity and wages. And so we're gonna see how they evolve. And the green line is the productivity normalized to one when we start. And then we see basically how they relatively evolve. And you see that initially they're really going in lockstep. And then from 1980 onwards, the wages start to stagnate. I have to say that this is not all wages because we know that some wages have gone up sharply. This is about 90, 85 to 90% of the people. Okay. So these are the typical production and service workers. And it's striking again that this happens in 1980. So productivity keeps going up, but wages don't keep up. Okay. This is real wages adjusted for inflation. And this is again telling us the story that. If you look in the data, there's many workers who get paid exactly the same as 10, 20, 30 years ago. Okay. And this is, again, striking because we see a lot of technological progress. That's what productivity growth tells us. But at the same time, what you know, the majority of the workers receive in pay has not changed. We can break it down. I already mentioned this, that there's differences between different types of groups. Let me break it down into four categories okay those who are doing high school or less those who have two years of college some professional training those of you uh, uh, who have four years of college and those who have more than four years of college the idea here is to show that there's obviously a lot of different 
kind of patterns going on. By the way, the four years and more college used to be a few percentages. Now it's just under 10%. Okay, and that's where I was saying, you know, the rest applies to the 90% of the individuals. If you look at that evolution, initially they evolved quite tied together. And then in the early 80s, they start to diverge. And they start to diverge. And not surprisingly, the ones with professional education, you know, people who have PhDs, who have masters, who have become a doctor, who have lawyers, their wages have uh, gone up. They've had a gain of around 45%. Those with four years of college who have studied, kind of just finished the university and no more, they have about a 15 to 20% uh, increase. Those with two years of college, a professional degree have no gain and the ones with high school have seen a fall in in their wages now let me tell you that from an economic point of view if you have competitive markets and i'm going to come then to the explanation you know what we say as economists your wage should reflect your productivity so if your wage is falling in a competitive market it means that basically your productivity is go going down now that's very unlikely because if you think about with all the technological progress even you know the least productivity growth that we see for jobs for occupations like say a security guard okay the security guard is doing the same thing now than what he or she did uh, 40 years ago but even there there's technological change because they can be monitored more easily they have gps devices there's other ways in which you can increase their productivity but this seems to suggest that these people typically people with high school or less uh, of a degree have seen if the wage is equal to the their productivity have seen a decline in their productivity. But of course, we already know that from this decoupling of wages and productivity, that's not really what's going on. That's something else um, uh, is going on. And let me give you the kind of the last fact about these consequences, which is something that as economists, we call job reallocation. It's a measure of business dynamism, how you know, dynamic firms are and why is job reallocation a measure of this? It basically says, how often do firms replace their workforce? How dynamic are they? And so in the early 80s, it was about 35% of their jobs turned over for whatever reasons, promotions, uh, hiring, also firing. There's all kind of, of uh, replacement going on. Now, if you look at what happened to that, this has started to fall, and this is now about 25%. And this is telling us that most firms see really a serious decline in that type of uh, dynamism. And this basically sums up a number of consequences that we have noted and that a lot of economists, by the way, have noted uh, um, for the last, you know, have started to discover it in, in, in the early 2000s because people had seen some of this going on, this wage stagnation. But we've never had a very good explanation for it. And so the question is, why is this happening? And so one of the stories that, that is making many of these different pieces of the puzzle fit together is that this is coming from the fact that firms have more market power, more dominant in their market, which means that they have less competition. By the way, let me show you a fact. You might think this is just a story of North America or of the United States. I'm going to show you data for the whole of the world. Markups are really what we call the price over the cost to produce something. It's not exactly the same as the profits, but it's related. And we can talk about the details about how we measure it and how we do it. But what we see is when we calculate the markups for firms around the world, in Europe, in North America, in Asia, they show very similar developments. This is not a story about North America. This is a story about the whole world. This is a global uh, phenomenon. And so, the question arises, why is this happening? Why is it that, you know, there is too little competition? And, and there's a different issues going on. And then the first issue that, in fact, we uh, started to investigate very early on, and that is playing some role is this issue about, you know, in the 19, early 1980s, there's a, a, a kind of a clear change in the type of policies in respect to antitrust that uh, happened. So people associate this with Reagan and Thatcher. This was, by the way, also more widespread, the Washington consensus people have talked about. And while this is also true, in fact, we estimate some of these models, we find that this plays some role, we find that something else plays a much bigger role, and that's technological change. And this is 1980s, really, you can say the start of the digital age, 
it obviously started earlier because things were developing already, you know, in the 50s and the 60s. But really, 1980 is the year where households and firms started to buy personal computers and that they introduced these kind of tools, if you want, these, these, this capital in their production. The 90s was, well, the kind of the rise of, of the internet. The, the 2000s was the rise of the networking and, 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 and mobile uh, devices. The 2010s is probably data, the big rise in data. I guess the 20s is going to be artificial intelligence. We can, and who knows what it will be. So it's not that there's just one change, but they're all related to the digital age. And what happened there is that this does enormously wonderful things to the economy and to society in the sense that we see an enormous increase in productivity. We see an enormous change in the quality of life. It, you know, contributes a lot to the, a lot of the things that we do now in a, making our lives much easier, simpler, more comfortable. And now we say that these new technologies, especially these fast changing technologies, they have a, a, a notion of being both the hero and the villain of the movie of the economy or of society, if you want. Why? Because they're the hero in that sense that these are technologies that, you know, you wouldn't want to not have those technologies if you think about how much they contribute to the way we do things. But these technologies also have one aspect, and that is that they allow, and this is the villain part, they allow these firms who employ them to also keep out competitors. And let me give you one example. It's a very tech example, and it needn't be that tech. But if you think about a platform like eBay, okay, how does technology help you? Well, when they came up with eBay in the mid 90s, of course, this is great because before you had to go to a kind of a Sunday market to buy secondhand books or to buy antiques or something like that. And maybe you found something there, maybe not. If you found the book, it wasn't really the one you were looking for because that one wasn't in the Antwerp market, but in the Brussels market, you didn't drive there on the same Sunday. So you could get stuff, but it was always a lot more complicated to do that. And then eBay comes along and you can find everything from anywhere around the world and they send it to you. Okay, and this is a huge increase in the capabilities of, in this case, exchange between individuals who have stuff. Now, and that's the hero part. But what's the villain part? A platform has this characteristic that it really likes scale. And so if I have something for sale, I want to be where all the buyers are. And if you want to buy something, you want to be where all the sellers are because you want to have choice and you have, to have the, the opportunity to, to, to choose different things. And so what we see is that there are what we call network effects. The larger it is, the more valuable it is. And even though this trading, this ability to exchange things that you couldn't exchange before is extremely valuable, the bad thing is that eBay is charging you 7 8 or 9% for a transaction. And you think, didn't competitors come around? And they did. Yahoo Auctions has tried this for a long time. And Yahoo Auctions comes along and they set up the same platform a similar platform they try to get the customers they say by the way you pay seven percent for ebay you can get it for half a percent for us okay so customers is amazing you want to go there no because there's no one there and this is the whole issue of having the large scale and these scale effects these scale economies are basically the barriers to entry and so these firms know this very well and they exploit this fact that if you have network effects that you can actually only be the only one in that in that market okay and so what you see is that the advantage that this technology creates is at the same time the impediment to competition okay and so the question is we want to have the advantages but you won't, we don't want to have the impediment and there's going to be part of the answer to finding solutions now before i come to the solutions this is not the first time we've seen this because if you go back to another era or an epoch of very fast technological change, like in 1900, and then it was the second industrial revolution with electricity, with rail travel, with oil exploration. What this did was also create enormous scale economies. And still now, you know, our rail travel has this network issue. It's very much like an eBay or like a social media. It's just physical, it's steel. 
instead of uh, um, something imaginary or virtual. The same thing with electricity. You see, electricity is still extremely highly um, regulated because if you let, you know, we want, and this is kind of the type of policies we have now, we want competition on these networks of electricity providers, but you have to heavily regulate it because if you don't regulate it, you get one monopolist. Okay, because the scale is, is so important. And this is basically not something new. The incarnation is different because it's now digital and it was physical before. And I guess when there's going to be a new, you know, transformation, technological transformation, there will be something similar happening. The only issue is that we're running behind. We were running behind 120 years ago and we're still running behind today in terms of how to deal with it. In fact, we still haven't fully figured out how to deal with the proper regulation of, of, of uh, electricity markets, for example. And if you go back and we see how it was resolved back then, it was resolved with two world wars and one great uh, depression, okay? Because it created, as it is creating now, a huge amount of inequality and polarization. And this eventually filters through to the society and in the, in the politics. And here, I hope we can get uh, 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 some of the discussion going in terms of what this uh, this means. The only thing I want to contribute here is that from a point of view of the economics, it's the economics that create the economic polarization, okay, which then feeds into the social and political uh, polarization. The story of this hero and the villain is best illustrated with um, how Warren Buffett, arguably the most successful investor in uh, at least in the last century or still today, um, argues what for him a good investment is. He says an investment is like a castle. If I buy stocks in a firm, I buy a castle and it's a valuable castle. And this is a strong, you know, well-built castle. And then on top of it, I want a duke who's in charge of the castle. And given the Duke, I want this person to be honest. I want this person to understand the business, the castle. I want a, this person to take care of the castle. But above all, for it to be a valuable investment, I want a big moat around it. I want a big moat around the castle because that really stops competitors from entering. And with these new technologies, the new technologies basically allow you to easily create the moat. That doesn't mean that there's no competition. You know, eBay had to fight very hard to be the first one and their, their innovation was to be the first one and in fact the Yahoo auctions has tried very hard to get into that market you know they try to get at that mode with offering half a percentage percentage um, commissions they did more because one of the arguments that ebay has always used is that you know we just have a superior technology our platform is better than yours this is by the way the same argument that apple is using now i don't know whether you follow this if you have kids who, who download fortnite 30% of what they pay for it goes to Apple just to use the platform. So they have Epic Games, the owner or the producer of Fortnite is in a lawsuit saying, you know, this is, you're abusing this position. eBay and Apple say we have just a superior network. But that doesn't hold ground very much because if you look at what happened in Japan, Yahoo Auctions was first in the Japanese market. eBay hadn't gone there yet. And for many years, eBay tried to get a hold of you know, some share of this auction market in uh, in Japan, but they could because Yahoo was there first. And for the same reason, Yahoo charges high commissions. eBay comes there, says, come at low commissions to my site, but there's no one there. You don't want to go there. So it persists. Okay. This seems to suggest that this is not an issue of a superior technology. This is just suggesting that the first one who's in there gets the entire market. And what these markets with enormous returns to scale tell us is that there's an enormous competition for the market. And once you have it, there's no competition in the market. And that's precisely the problem. You know, if you ask someone who runs a business, you know, running a business is all about having profits and running a business is by being first and doing something innovative such that you get and obtain some of these profits. The difference with what's going on or the problem with what's going on today is that, you know, typically that's temporary, but now these modes that these firms have created are very long-term. They're obviously not going to be forever because technology will change and new things are going to happen. But usually these temporary gains are for one or two years and you're you have this advantage for this new technology and then other firms start to copy or innovate even better and so on. 
But what we see now with the eBay's and the Facebooks, and in fact, by the way, I should also say it's in all sectors. It's also in textiles. It's also in retail. It's also in beer. If you go to Leuven, because ABM is one of these large companies, is the problem is that these modes are there semi permanently. Okay, and that's that's the problem. So now, in terms of solutions, what can we do? Well, sometimes you may want to break up the, these firms, but usually you don't. What kind of firms would you want to break up? The ones that shouldn't have merged in the first place. For example, Facebook should not, never have been allowed to buy Instagram and, and, and uh, WhatsApp. And so maybe now you still want to split them up if you can. But I think mainly the issue is that what you want to do is you want to really keep the advantage of the scale of this network. So in the case of a eBay, an eBay platform, you really want it to be large. That's where the value is. But you want to regulate who's operating on it. And this is a kind of a, a concept that's coming from, from IT. Interoperability is a way in which you do it. You separate basically the network from the operators on it. And that requires regulation. That requires basically some institution, typically the antitrust authority, that proposes regulation to ensure that there's many competitors on this network. Let me give you an example where this is the case. My phone plan with Movistar in Spain cost about uh, two to three times what it uh, cost uh, Syria. Uh, in the US, at and costs two to three times what it costs with Movistar. So Movistar is cheaper. There's not a general thing about the US being worse or better just for that particular market. There's a piece of regulation that says, if you own a network of cell towers, you are by law required to let competitors use your network of cell towers. That's the big investment. And so if a Polish operator or a Belgian operator comes to Spain and says, I want to compete for the market, they enter into that market and they basically don't have to invest heavily, taking years, you know, buy real estate and do this thing, this very expensive network. They can just go to the incumbent firm and say, you know, the regulator says, I have to pay you a fee. The regulator sets the fee and I can enter as a competitor in this market. What do I do? The first thing I lower my price because I want to get your customers. And then you in response lower prices and we get competition in a market, even though there's a network because the network is separated from the operators on the network. And this, this idea of interoperability is actually very broad and has a lot of uh, potential. It's on the table and on people's kind of tip of their tongues that people talk about, but it's going to be very hard to get this through politically because, of course, there's the influence of many of the firms who benefit from not having that regulation, who influence the political process. And this is true in the United States, but this is true in Europe. This is true everywhere. Okay, I had the advantage to talk to one of the former um, uh, commissioners for antitrust. And, uh, you know, they told me there's pressure all the time this political pressure indirectly and directly, because these firms have enormous uh, uh, benefits from not having that regulation. I mean, that's where these enormous profits come from. And I think that's a vicious circle, a vicious circle between these kind of positions of market power with high profit profitability and lack of competition that creates profits, that creates cash. You can use the cash to influence the political process through lobbying, through uh, campaign finance, through all kinds of uh, different aspects. And by influencing the process, you obtain regulation that makes it easier for you to maintain or even enlarge the mode and make it even easier for you to be dominant in your market. Now, if that's the case, it brings you more cash, more profits. And so now you can influence policy even more. And we see that that's something that's definitely going on for these large firms. And this is the kind of the connection of the pure economic side to the, uh, uh, the political side. Let me wrap up, uh, at least for my part here, and, and, and I hope we can uh, have, have uh, uh, the views that you have on this, by just saying, you know, next time you hear on the TV screen, some of these uh, announcements that the Dow Jones probably will have reached 40,000, um, I would suggest that you think twice before you think this is great news about the economy. This is saying something about the economy. It's saying that a small number of dominant firms are making enormous profits and they're projected to make profits because it's about what's going to happen in the future. But 
that this is not good news for the rest of the economy. Okay, that this is not good for startups, that this is not good for small businesses, that this is not good for workers, that this is not good for business dynamism, and in a sense that this is really creating inequality and, and polarization. At the same time, you know, we know that if we let this go on, if history is teaching us something, they say uh, history rhymes, but it doesn't repeat. I mean, let's hope that we don't have to go through what we went through in the first half of the last century to uh, resolve that kind of polarization and that uh, inequality. And there's ways in which to do it. It will require political will. It will require an, an ability to separate politics from policy. Okay, and we've managed to do this for, you know, for economists, the big success story is the independence of the central bank. We know that if you let, you know, inflation in the hands of politicians, you get the story of Argentina or Venezuela, where basically it's a, a, a kind of, a, you know, a political tool to win elections, but it's not, it's not beneficial for the economy. And that's why we have independent central banks. I mean, also in Western Europe, in the United States, in Australia, in the 70s, we had high inflation. Why? Because central banks were not independent and they were not with a clear objective, the central bank is now a very clear objective, 2% inflation. Okay, look at what everyone's talking about. Inflation has shot up for whatever reason, but then there's an immediate reaction. You'll see the reaction from the central banks. Politicians might react differently. Okay, And I think we can do something similar in the realm of antitrust policy, where we really have to find a way to separate politics from uh, policy. And then there's tools in which to do it. I gave you the example of interoperability, separating the network from the competition on the network. But whatever we do is always going to be a way of reaching more competition, of trying to have more competition. And that's why it may sound contradictory that you say, you know, how can more competition give you lower profits? Well, because basically you're going to have people entering and undercutting each other's prices. It may be associated with kind of a cutthroat Darwinian uh, uh, kind of setting. But I, I, I think that what we have now is much worse. What we have now is that these firms are cozy and they do actually a lot of competitive action to avoid that there's competition. This, this fighting for the market, this, this winning uh, um, their markets rather than, than having, or competing for markets rather than have, have competition in the market. And if that happens, then I think there is the potential for getting more startups, more innovation, stop the wage stagnation that we've seen, and ultimately not have the polarization and the uh, uh, inequality that is going on and, and getting worse uh, anytime. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very happy to hear your opinions. Let's see if this works. Yes, perfect. Um, so thanks, Jan Eckhardt, for this fantastic presentation. Very happy to uh, listen to you. And um, people here in this room or in the chat, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. Um, okay. So your hand up first, you come around. Thanks, Jan. There's, I have one burning question. What do you think is the, 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 the role of, of um, the decline, as it were, of organized labor and perhaps more broadly of left-wing party uh, power. Because in the, in, the, in the great decoupling between productivity and wages, you would think that the decline in union membership, collective bargaining, and so on, that that obviously plays a role. Um, it isn't quite clear to me what, what the causal mechanisms would be if you think about uh, the, the, the rising profit margins, but I, I can imagine that you have thought uh, about this. And of course, it strikes me that everything started in the 1980s, which was, of course, the time of uh, Reagan and Thatcher, uh, neoliberalism, and, and kind of very primitive notions about what good economic policy is. And, and at that time, the idea was deregulate, deregulate, and everything will be, will be fine. And we, of course, we, we know that that's not uh, the case now. So I would like to, to hear your reflections uh, about not only the decline of organized labor, but perhaps also what happened in the political sphere. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thanks. You. I mean, of course, it's a very important uh, issue. Um, I already mentioned that also in the antitrust world, this had an 
kind of an influence because there's in the United States that then came over to Europe this Borg doctrine that that became came in effect, which was the idea that you know at that time markets were fairly competitive. You don't have to do anything because you know it works. Without uh, uh, going from that realm of the of antitrust, let's talk about more the labor market and 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 organized labor. It was one of the first things that we started looking at. And of course, that's an, an, an important ingredient that also has, has a big effect. There's other things in the labor market that also people uh, have looked at. We haven't looked at it directly, but things like demographics have changed a lot. What we find when we look at uh, uh, organized labor, this is basically, you know, the idea of monopsony is one way in which the firm can exert its, its dominant position in the labor market. It's not exactly the same as organized labor, but it's related because if I'm a dominant firm in a market, I'm, I'm Toyota in, in Alabama, and there's just, you know, Birmingham, Alabama, there's not much else there, but, but the Toyota firm, I have a lot of power in the wage setting over my workers. And, you know, you have that type of dominance also. So that definitely exists. Well, one of the things we, it's not everything in terms of organized labor, but that's one way in which to counter it because you can counter the big firm with, with, with organized labor. One of the things we've done is we've, we've analyzed the coexistence of the effect on wages directly, and then also on what we call labor force participation, how many people actually decide to work. The effect of this monopsony power, okay, which then is or is not counted by organized labor, and the effect of monopoly power. So before I tell you what we find, let me also just say one of the kind of counterintuitive things that I try to explain in the book is, is the fact that, you know, why would the price of some good, say beer, affect work? And it's a kind of a, a, a chain of events, which is that you charge too high a price for a good. That means the consumption is lower because people consume less of it. If they consume less of it, the production is lower. Therefore, labor demand goes down and therefore wages go down. And so does labor force participation. That's that's one channel. The other channel is through monopsony power. Firms exert direct effect on the wages of their workers. A union can countervail that force. If the union disappears, this increases that 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 kind of uh, power. When we estimate and measure this, and we can again talk about you know how we do it. What we find is that a, kind of between um, one fifth to two fifths of the wage stagnation is due to the monopsony power and about three fifths to four fifths is due to this indirect channel of monopoly power. Okay, now why is it so big, the monopoly power channel? Because there's basically so many firms that have a dominant position. And when I say so many firms, so many firms in it, there's, a few, there's not many of them, but it's in every market there's one. And that's where I always talk about, there's these 400 firms globally that are so dominant that this indirect mechanism through labor demand and falling wages is actually making stronger the effect that's already coming from monopsony. So the monopsony effect is there. It is one channel, but we find that in terms of quantitative magnitude, the other channel uh, is bigger. And one of the things that we, you know, of course we've, and other people have worked on this too, it's not just us who, who have done this. What we see is that Ultimately, there is actually quite a bit of labor mobility. People have options to take different jobs. And in a sense, technology might have made it better, by which I mean, of course, Uber somehow makes it, is not paying high wages. But the reason why they're paying high, not high wages is because of this wage stagnation. But people who work at Uber, they love to work there because it's very flexible. And this flexibility allows them to, you know, maybe they don't like Uber anymore and they drive now a truck for a while and they can switch easily. And that somehow has made the labor market, you know, less susceptible to this dominant position of many of these firms, which is there, but we find that it's about one to two fifths of the, 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 the wage stagnation. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that the, the, the ultimately the kind of the effect of, of, of organized labor, okay, is unfortunately not going to be helping the monopoly power because through 
with organized labor, since this is what we call a general equilibrium effect, it's not Google that pays its workers badly. That's the case with monopsony. It's Toyota that pays its workers in Birmingham, Alabama badly because they can do it because the workers have nowhere else to go. There's only one firm. But this monopoly effect, if you have organized labor, what's going to happen is Google's price setting has effects on labor because Google has too high prices for what it sells. Facebook has too high prices. Amazon has too high prices. And this is basically what we call a general equilibrium effect. And you can't identify one individual firm and therefore the union cannot get at it. It's a little bit like the effects of CO2 pollution. You know, someone who drives a car causes asthma in someone, but it's not one individual who causes asthma. It's the 3 billion cars that are on the road in the world that cause asthma for, you know, 17 million people. I just invented these numbers. It's just, what I'm trying to say is that we cannot attribute the action of one to the effect it has on someone else. And so this monopoly effect is, is this, you know, kind of global economy uh, uh, effect that's going on at the same time. Okay, um, thank you, Jan. Thank I'll you. try to have a bit shorter answer, so sorry. <laughs> okay, next question, what's here? Yeah, thank you very much. I was wondering whether there is not a difference here in, in cross-national variation in, in uh, moderation and equalization of, of wages, wage effects here. You go into that, is, is there a way to f figure out that causality? And then the, the second uh, remark, or yeah, it's more a remark, and, and I'm a bit puzzled as a political scientist to hear this type of characterization. Ah, the solution is not uh, politics, the solution is the disjuncture from politics. It's a bit weird, no? I mean, as if the, as if central banks were being created independently all of a sudden kind of deus ex machina. I mean, the fact that we had central banks doing inflation targeting was because we had the, the electorate becoming not only wage dependent, but starting to save. That's a political explanation for why we got central banking, inflation targeting central banking. So that's a reinterpretation and a non-economistic interpretation. And wouldn't that be useful to now also say, like, it's political intervention that will save us from this disaster, instead of saying, ah, it's going to be technocratic, economistic as a solution. How would you react to that? As an I mean, first of all, it, it, I'm arguing that we need more political intervention. What I think that the, the, in this case, and I'm not saying that this is now applying to everything, and the, the parallel I was making with, with the central bank independence is that with antitrust policy, I think that it's too easy for politicians to be bought by the interested parties, just in the same way that it's too easy for an Argentinian politician to say, oh, I'm going to just increase money supply a little bit because elections in six months, people are going to feel like the economy is booming. Of course, six months after the elections, we have inflation, right? And that's why we've decided that, you know, we want a political solution, but we want it to be disjoint from the political cycle of elections. We can argue about, you know, uh, whether that's a good decision from an economic point of view. I don't think there's any economy where the politician makes the decision, the final decision on inflation, that they control inflation. We, I don't know of, of successful uh, stories. And it's been that story that's, you know, the high inflation that we had in the 70s in the Western economies was resolved by exactly that. Now, of course, first of all, we need very clear mandates. Marine Le Pen, when she was running for president the last time, she said, we want the central bank to be no longer independent. In fact, we want it back to France. Okay. She perfectly understands what's going on here. And she would like to have that too, as a politician. Okay. So now we can argue, is this disenfranchising the voter, for example? Right? Because in a sense, you're taking away some of that direct power of the politician, therefore you take it away from, from, from the, the, the voter. And of course, there's always a trade-off there. I, I believe that in this case, the voter gains in the sense that you know, it's very much in, in a, a kind of an, an, a roundabout way that the politician is, is uh, using it. Now, is this also true in the case of antitrust, I think in the case of antitrust, because money is so important and we already see it, judges are influenced, politicians are influenced, the whole process 
is uh, influenced. That I think, in a way, by having more political intervention, by setting a very clear playing field, I always compare it to sports, you know. At the moment, we're playing football with one team has 15 players, the other one has seven. A referee who's biased, who's basically the coach of the team at the 15, and the field is like this, and the 15 are at the top. And, and, and so I think that the role of policy and of institutions is for them to be designed in such a way that the level playing, that we have a level playing field, that we have clear rules about who can play, that we have an independent arbiter. Okay, and of course that this is under the supervision of of uh, politics, but not directly. There's a game now. Let's now see how we can put the politician to be the referee. Let's maybe put someone there who is supervised in terms of you know when we set up the league. But that particular game, there's not going to be one arbiter who's going to be able to decide. I see it as more influence of politics, but yes, with a clear separation of the direct vested interest of some of these. Uh, um, politicians and uh, parties uh, that, that might uh, influence. Uh, I went a long way. Your first question, can you give me a quick? Oh, yes. So, so cross national, so, so of course, there's huge differences across countries. Okay. One of the things that economists have been struggling with for a long time is to understand, for example, what happened in France. There's this thing that we call the skill premium. When I showed you the four categories of education, this is really what we call the skill premium. It's basically the ratio of the average wage of the top over the bottom. Okay. And that's been going up everywhere except in France. People don't understand this, didn't understand it. Then some French uh, researchers came up with a very interesting explanation, which is that France used to have the, uh, the employer contribution to be very regressive. It was linear, so you paid a fixed percentage. And then if you earned more than that, you didn't even pay anymore. So that was basically kind of subsidized. It was like, you know, regressive. It wasn't progressive taxation. Then with Mitterrand, they started to have a linear for everyone. So even if you had high incomes, you still pay that. And then later on with Hollande, they made it progressive. So what happens is there's a huge change over time here. What is happening to the pay that you take home? If you were one of these high earners in the 70s, you took it all home because you had a very regressive payroll tax. Now it's extremely progressive. So your employer pays this, so you get less of that. And so what these researchers did was they calculated the, the, what we call the skill premium, not on what the, the worker takes home, but on what the firm has to pay, including that tax. And then France, like any other country, has a sharply increasing skill premium. The point I'm trying to make is that not all countries are the same, but we see differences because there's also, apart from fundamental differences that things don't happen exactly the same, also very big policy differences. For example, France changed over time its policy and that had implications for how we measure what those wages are and what really the, the labor cost is, what, what is the, the, the relevant part. And we see, you know, people talk for a, a lot about the Scandinavian countries in terms of wage policies, for example. But we see once you adjust and account for how these policies affect the take home pay, we see very similar uh, developments across country with its own differences, but there's more similarities over time. For example, you know, the influence of robotization in, in Scandinavia is huge and how it leads to dispersion in wages. Scandinavia has as much wage stagnation as many of the other countries. Okay. Now, of course, the take home pay is different because there's a lot of policies that redistribute. And ultimately that's where policy is, is valuable. The only thing, I'm proposing is that we should go one step further and you know there's many reasons and ways in which we redistribute we can also actually redistribute through a kind of indirect way, which is to create more competition. Okay, and that's really what uh, 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 I argue, we should still have all the type of redistribution mechanisms as well. Um, but we can achieve many of the goals that we're trying to achieve with the direct redistribution by creating uh, more competition. Okay, thank you. I saw um, another question in the room, but first I would like to uh, ask some questions from the chat because I saw that uh, two people asked uh, questions. Oh, uh, the number has risen. Um, 
let's start with the first two. Um, so I see that Bas was the first one. Um, Bas, if you uh, would like to unmute and ask your question, I hope. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. No, there was this uh, recent research on the, the misallocation of capital, whereas the real interest rate has known a large decline since the beginning of the century. And I would like to know whether you think that uh, this has facilitated the market power of these big firms since they can invest more compared to new startups. Uh, this is a great question. I talk about it in the book, actually. So there's this one, as you suggest, in the way that you know they have more access to capital. There's one puzzling fact that we see capital investment has declined okay and it's kind of if market power increases you sell less you hire less labor that's the downward pressure on, on on wages but you also hire less capital so that's there's two forces going on at the same time there's one other thing that's related to the decline in the real interest rate which i think is um uh how should i say it kind of much less intuitive but it's the following that because there is so much uh, such a high profitability, what happens is that the supply of capital of cash basically has increased a lot. In fact, household saving is typically around three to four to five percent. Now that we have, and this is as a share of GDP, when I showed you the profit rate of eight percent of sales of GDP, that's around 15, 16 percent. So what we see is that now, there's a huge inflow of cash from these profits. So the supply of capital, if you look at the capital market, has increased because you have the household savings, which hasn't increased. And now you add to that, you know, this three or 4% of, of GDP of household saving, you add to that 15% of profits, which weren't there. What happens to the price? Well, if I increase the supply, the price is going to drop. What is the price of the capital market? It's the interest rate. It's the real interest rate. And what market power does is it has the opposite or the reverse causality as what you were suggesting which, which, which is there but kind of there's there's uh, uh, opposing forces what this reverse causality does is it market power basically dampens the interest rate okay the real rate and that is uh, something that concerns politicians and concerns the central bank because it makes their policies not responsive you know if you follow the central bank policies they 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 really don't know how to what to do, at least until there was inflation in the last uh, six months, but they don't know what to do because whatever they do, it doesn't have any impact on, on, on interest rates. If it doesn't have an impact on interest rate, you can't really move inflation. Okay, and, and I argue that we have to be careful about the effect that the amount of cash that's in the economy has on the equilibrium interest rate. Does this answer your question? I suppose this means yes. Yes, sorry, um, I unmuted my I unmuted myself, but yes, thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, before we go back to the chat, I would like to take the question from the room. One moment. Thank you so much for the fascinating presentation. I enjoy that. Uh, just two questions: What's the role of the entrepreneurial state, if any? Mazzucato's contribution, as you know, uh, in the whole process. I mean, uh, would we expect, I would say, uh, an entrepreneurial state to affect the whole process and change a few things there? One and second, what's the role for uh, of artificial intelligence in the whole process? Maybe it's because of the mask. Can you repeat the first part? The artificial intelligence. I what's the role of the entrepreneurial state? of um, Mariana Mazzucatos uh, in the whole process, if any. And two, about the role of artificial intelligence in the whole process, whether this may change the whole picture. Thank you. So, so I mean, artificial intelligence, let me start with the second one. It's going, I believe it's going to be another way to build modes. It's going to allow you, you know, to have access to data. Software is not the precious resource. Data is the resource. And artificial intelligence is really exploiting the value of that. So I think things are only going to get worse. If you see, if you go back to the Dow Jones, why it's rising so much, there's now five firms in the world that are valued over a trillion US dollars. Okay. And they're all doing Amazon Web Cloud, Microsoft Azure. And this is all artificial intelligence and big data. 
Okay, so I think it's 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 increasing even further <clears throat> uh, uh, the trend that we're seeing now. Um, with respect to uh, Mariana Matsukati's uh, thesis, I mean, there's a lot of aspects of that that we should heed attention to. I tend to disagree with the following that she sees a solution of the intervention of the state, okay, in, for example, doing innovation. If we see that even the big firms themselves who've been big innovators, you know, Facebook was a big, big innovator, Google has been, a, that they are stifling innovation. And I think that innovation is inherently, if you look at what happens to the way science works, is coming from small players. When I was showing you earlier that the building blocks of the society being these startup firms, okay, we see this because they've dropped so much. We see that the innovation rate has dropped. The number of patents that they get because there's fewer of those firms is dropping. Now, of course, these big firms do innovation too. Of course, a government can do it too. But I think that we, you know, we, we see, especially at least in the data, that much of the innovation is coming from these small players. And at the moment, they're being uh, suffocated by the big players. And I'm not sure whether what she proposes that, you know, say, uh, a government being, you know, she, she always talks about the moonshot and the idea that the government is, is stimulating this. By the way, we're doing this enormously already, because if you go back to, I forget their names, the couple, the uh, German-Turkish couple who uh, uh, found the, basically the Pfizer, we call it Pfizer because Pfizer basically bought the patent, but, um, you know, they were on ERC grants. They've basically financed the innovation on ERC grants. I saw him give a presentation, which was extremely interesting. He says, I've, you know, of course, the guy is extremely successful doing real estate. I've been doing this since 2004 when he published his first paper on this issue. Okay. And he uses it to fight cancer, to have uh, all, all different things. And then also viruses, whatever, because it's a particular technology that works, all financed by public money. And in that sense, I completely agree. I don't think it's that we need a big institution that says, okay, let's now do the in investigation. Let's maybe finance people like uh, uh, these researchers. Where does the big company come in? Of course, these researchers can't run drug trials, okay? Because this is, requires a lot of money to start to run this. And then they can't get it to market and market it and they can't get it produced, right? Because their drug is at what, minus 50 degrees or something like that. So. It's extremely complicated in terms of the production processes to do it. And that's where these Pfizer's and these Moderna's come in. But now they're capturing a lot of that market power, of course. Okay. And so, you know, the government is doing, I think, already a lot of things right. If we had more competition, then we can talk about patent policy, which is, I think, up for renewal and revision in terms of what we know, how to design optimally uh, these things that is causing a lot of, of distortions. But just to answer your question, I don't think that Marianne's kind of suggestion of a policy of putting this in the hands of the, the government is the right one. The government plays a big role, but not, I think, that uh, role. Okay, thank you. Um, let's return to the chat. So there was another question by Stephen or Steve. Um, Able to unmute yourself, Steve, and ask a question directly. Um, if not, then um, okay, it's a rather complicated question to read, I have to say. <laughs> Uh, in that case, I will uh, jump to Tom De Hert. Um, he also asked a question about monopoly power. Um, Tom, if you would like to ask your question. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Lucas. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jan, for the uh, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I, my question is um, on a comparison um, of your story on wages with uh, with the story on intermediate and input markets, in fact. Um, so the argument you make is that mono monopoly power 
Um, and I take it that this was in final consumer markets in, in uh, high uh, income countries also exerted pressure on wage, wages. But can a similar story be, be valid also for uh, pressure exerted on input and intermediate product markets? And, and, um, and uh, per consequence also um, tell us something about um, global inequality? Okay, thank you. I mean, these are very good points. So, so first of all, one intermediate input market is the labor market, right? And we talked about monopsony power that's that's uh, going on. One of the issues we just don't look at at final consumer markets. One of the issues we see is that there's a lot of monopsony power in non-labor markets. What Amazon is accused of is that it, it really squeezes its suppliers. And if I'm selling Belgian cookies for the American market, I get squeezed. And this is a true story because I have a friend who's in the US selling uh, uh, Belgian cookies. And they really, they, 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 you know, you get to sell 2 million boxes a year, which is bigger than the market in Belgium, but your margins are much lower. Okay, because they uh, uh, squeeze you. So there's market power being exerted in the input market towards the suppliers. One of that is a supplier of labor, but also a supplier of other goods. And I think it's it's much more uh, uh, broadly. On the question of inequality, the, 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 I think, first of all, that the issue of market power, you know, these are all global firms and it's a global problem. So if we think about what, um, what the, the, the reach of this is, one of the reasons why I think it's a global problem, even if we saw that, uh, you know, say in Europe, markups weren't going up, we're all using products that have been basically produced by firms with market power. And the fact that I used Google Maps to come here, and it's true, I don't pay, but we can then talk about how, how I pay with my data to, to, to come here is that, it doesn't matter that they are in Cupertino, California. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter where this, the, 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 the producer even is. It matters where the customer is. And it's the customer who's being affected. And then you say, but how about the labor? Well, it's the customer service that's going to be a call center maybe in India that's affected. And so, you know, it's, it's very much a, a global uh, uh, phenomenon. All that said, we see that also, you know, we have our ABM, Bev, we have Belgian markets that are very high and profits that are very high for one company. We have Booking.com in the Netherlands. We have um, Inditex in Spain. We have, you know, in all sectors and all uh, industries everywhere. It is true it's more concentrated in the United States, but ultimately, again, it's where the customers are that, that it, it, it matters uh, most. And then finally, on your question about inequality, one of the things that we see in terms of inequality, global inequality has declined. Okay, if you look at the income distribution of, of the seven or eight billion individuals in the world, that you know, Gini coefficients, the variance, everything has declined. But one of the things that has happened, and of course, it's if, if you look at some of these dynamic graphs, what's going on is that of course China has grown very fast, India has growing grown very fast. And so you see a big chunk, nearly half the world population for these two countries they're moving up fast. And so that, that's why the inequality has reduced. But the local and within country inequality has increased. And so basically in a way through globalization and through outsourcing, we've imported some of that global inequality locally. Okay, because what happens is that here now we have much bigger differences between you know, the low skilled workers and the high skilled workers. And I think the global inequality is you know, globally seen as if the economy is one economy has declined, but the within country inequality in all countries also in China and India, by the way, has, go, has gone up uh, substantially. And I think this is not disconnected from this, uh, this, this phenomenon of this uh, digitization, which I, I think is the, the driver behind it. Thank you. Um, does anybody in the room have another question? Uh, we will return to the chat and I will see if there is one more. No, in fact, uh, <laughs> Tom, you asked the, the final question. Um, so if there's no more question in the room. Um, ah, yeah. Tim. This last question, uh, I'm Tim Soons, I'm a historian and I like the uh, image, of course, but also the comparison, which is evidently with the antitrust laws of the late 19th century, uh, with big trusts in America, Standard Oil, um, 
in the fruit sector, uh, in, in every sector. But then, of course, you had the alternative was the state, which regulated. Um, the state was able to breach the moat, and that also fits the image you are showing, because a castle and a moat can defend against a sort of peasant insurrection, but if a royal army comes by, the castle is taken without problems. So in the 19th century also, there was an alternative. There was the state which said, well, this kind of public service provisioning, we cannot tolerate that uh, these companies set their prices way too high. And so we intervene, we uh, rule. But, and it, it has shown up already, there was an alternative in the late 19th century being the state and a sort of public service provisioning um, but that alternative is no longer viable. I was thinking in these, these, what is the alternative today? You already said, well, I don't think it's the state, but is there another alternative? All these companies are providing platforms for consumers to interact and, and the alternative, I would say as an outsider is a sort of open source world, which is perhaps the 21st century alternative of the public service state organized of the nine, which, which broke the power of the 19th century trusts. Uh, do you think that that's viable? That a sort of in, in, the, in the, this, this technological sector, this, this ICT digital world, that there is a sort of, that these technologies which are now monopolized by these big companies will be, will evolve to a sort of consumer-based open access platforms. And in the end, the companies might become, um, well, um, we would no longer need them. Thank you. Um, first of all, I agree with a lot of what you say, everything in fact. Um, and it's true that, you know, in the early 20th century, Teddy Roosevelt as a president, Republican president, by the way, you know, split up these big companies. I mean, he got into a big fight with JP Morgan because he split up his, his railway company. Um, <clears throat> it cost him his third election that he tried to get, but um, um, it was definitely, you know, there was definitely much more power to politicians. Of course, at that time, we didn't have much legal backing you were saying it was the government because the sherman act which is this act that really starts with antitrust law uh, is from the late 19th century and and before there was nothing and then there's a number of uh, ensuing acts that came later so so i guess because there's no laws politics was more powerful i presume but but i agree today this is this is clearly not possible there's an interesting thing you you hinted at the open source um Unfortunately, I'm not so optimistic. I wish that was the solution. If you think I talked about interoperability, this idea that you know you make networks that are interoperable, one of the things is that many of these people who design the internet and whoever that is, you know, Al Gore claimed it was him, but you know, the, the, the IT people, they were really, really idealist. Okay, in the 50s, and one of the things that they wanted, they really wanted interoperability. They understood the ability to monopolize. For example, now you can send an email from any internet service provider to another one. That's because these guys said the backbone of the internet is open. And, and that's interoperability because I'm, you know, Belgacom or whoever does what, and I can get on that backbone and I can sell stuff to customers, but I can't monopolize that backbone. I'm not allowed to do that because they designed it in the 50s like that. The thing is, and they knew that the problem was monopoly. They knew that it would be too easy to monopolize. And they said, no, no, whoever gives you an email address, you'd be able, you have to be able to send it from one to the other. Phone numbers is the same thing. You know, this took a little bit more time because they had to deregulate and allow you to switch phone numbers, for example. There was a time when this was very hard. Okay. Why am I not so optimistic? Because, of course, with the social networks, for example, if we had had these people from the 50s design it, they would have said there was going to be one social network, your Facebook, you want to come on it, there's going to be regulation, you can latch onto it like you latch on as an ISP, an internet service provider, and you're going to sell accounts to people and you can do that. But now they have the whole network, they have the backbone of the social network. 
they run it through the internet, which is open source, but they've created a network which is theirs. And in fact, I can't, you know, be on the Facebook network if I'm from LinkedIn. It's a different network. They're, they're, they're separate. There's, there's, there's no, no communication between them. I'm a little bit less optimistic about having that decentralized because we're in a kind of, you know, we're already in a situation where all these, these valuable networks, valuable for, of course, the owners of it, are cemented. And in the design stage, when they said the backbone of the internet is open because it didn't exist, and they, they created it uh, like that. But social networking hasn't been created like that. It's been created directly as monopolies. And that's why I think that, that you know, open source is going to have a hard time getting their foot in it, just the same way that Yahoo Auctions had a hard time or still has a hard time getting into uh, uh, the, the eBay's uh, market. But I am a little bit optimistic, too, about the type of regulation that we can do. So. It, it's not gonna, I think, come from open source directly. Maybe if we have regulation, we have government intervention that's gonna regulate, maybe then the open source is gonna see a habitat where they can flourish. And I think this is gonna first need the regulation to allow them to be on those networks. And then once that's, again, a bit more closer to the open backbone for the internet, then they open source may have a, a chance. But as it is now without intervention, I, I don't see how it's going to happen. Thank you. All right, then um, I would say this was the last question. <laughs> Yeah, I think it is uh, time to stop. Uh, thank you very much, Jan, for your amazing pr uh, presentation, for the wonderful discussion. It was a pleasure to have you here. And uh, yeah, I hope uh, you're very successful with your book and uh, sell it well to the politicians who are in charge of changing <laughs> thank something. Thank you very much. <laughs>